And as I begin today, I need to remind you again, in case you weren't paying attention during the announcement time, that next week there will be special presentations from Brad Huddleston during each service and in the afternoon. And all of you should plan to be present for all of those presentations, as many as possible for sure, and you'll benefit most from coming to all of them. And you should invite your friends to come next week as well. You should invite your friends every week, but next week too. Uh, you also all should be thankful for Brad Huddleston's coming to Cornerstone because we are near the end of the book of Judges. And instead of having the end of the book of Judges hanging over your head for the next three weeks, I decided to have mercy on you and we will deal with the final two chapters of the book of Judges now. So instead of having three more weeks of the book of Judges, we're going to finish it today. So please turn with me to chapter 20. I heard amen from the front row. Please turn to Judges chapter 20 with me. And uh, buckle up, because this, this week's text starts where last week's text left off. Uh, so verse 1 of chapter 20 tells us that all of Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, that means from north to south, gathered at Mizpah. And they said, tell us how this awful thing happened. So they come at the Levites' request because of what happened in the text last week. They're all upset, and they want to know how all this happened. So if you look at verse 4, the Levite says to the people of Israel, I and my concubine came to Gibeah and Benjamin to spend the night. During the night, the men of Gibeah came after me and surrounded the house, intending to kill me. They raped my concubine, and she died. I took my concubine, cut her into pieces, and sent one piece to each region of Israel's inheritance because they committed this lewd and outrageous act in Israel. Now, for those of you who remember last week, which I hope is all of you, but those of you who remember will know that what the Levite engages here is what we call revisionist history. It's not exactly the way that the events of the story happened. Uh, I mean, the, the story he tells is, 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 is spruced up to make himself look a little better. Uh, of course, if you, want to use, if you don't want to use fancy words, you just want to speak plainly, we could point out that what the Levite does here is lie. Because you'll remember that in the text we saw last week, the Levite and his concubine, his fake wife, not wife, did end up in Gibeah, a town in the territory of Benjamin, but you'll remember that they ended up there because of foolish decisions by the Levite. And you'll remember that all the men of the town did surround the house where they were staying, but not to kill the Levite. No, no. The men of Gibeah wanted to have sex with him. He leaves that part out when he retells the story. And he says that the men of the town raped and killed his concubine, which is true, but you'll remember that that only happened after he shoved her out the door and shut it behind her. And Levite leaves out that little detail as well. And the Bible says that the Israelites were outraged at the Levite's story, and they prepare to avenge the Levite by going to war against the town of Gibeah. So they send messengers to the tribe of Benjamin, demanding that they hold the men of Gibeah responsible for this horrible crime, and that they put the men to death. Now we must remember that the biblical punishment for rape is death. And we might have less rape in our society if we had just a severe, as, as severe a view of it in our justice system. But that is the punishment set forth in the Bible. So the men of Israel demand that the men of Benjamin do this to the people of Gibeah. However, the Bible tells us that the Benjamites would not listen to the rest of the Israelites, and they got ready for battle. So you have to have a clear picture of what's going on here. What's happening here is civil war in the nation of Israel. All of Israel versus the tribe of Benjamin. And as Benjamin gets ready for battle, they muster 26,700 men. And the rest of Israel marches against them with 400,000. The odds are slightly not even. So Benjamin comes to battle. The Israelites march out with 400,000. And when they get there, they decide 
to ask God about it. They've already decided for themselves that war is the right action, but they ask God, who should go first into the fight? And God says, Judah shall go first. They ought to already know this, though, because Judah always goes first. When they traveled in the desert, Judah was always first after the ark. When they entered the promised land to take it over, God commanded Judah to go first. So they should know the answer to this question already. So God tells them, Judah is to go first. But notice there in your Bible when God responds to their question, God does not say that they will be victorious. So the Israelites go into battle against Benjamin. And they lose. The Benjamites killed 22,000 Israelites that day. So the Israelites go back to God and ask that they should go fight the Benjamites again. And God says, go up against them. But again, notice, God does not guarantee victory. And it happens again. Israel fights Benjamin. Israel loses and retreats. The Benjamites kill 18,000 more Israelites. That's 40,000 Israelites dead so far, or one-tenth, 10% of their fighting force brought in total. And this is a troubling section of the story for us, because twice now, it seems as if God has said to the Israelites, go into battle, but both times they lose. So didn't God tell them to go? Well, this all goes back to the line that we find repeated often throughout the end of the book of Judges. Israel had no king, and everyone did as they saw fit. And everyone, in that everyone did as they saw fit, everyone includes the army marching out in righteous indignation at the events at what happened in Gibeah, which of course they didn't really know the whole truth about. But even those men, even that army, are doing as they see fit. So when they come and ask God, they approach Him however they want, without proper respect. God isn't their king. And when they ask Him if they should go to war, they've already concluded that they're going to go because it's what they think is right. More or less, they are asking God out of formality. In fact, they are already at war when they ask God if they should go to war, because they're doing what they think is best. So in essence, God says, you're going to do what you want to do anyway, so do it. But he doesn't say that they'll win, because they're not going to, and because God allows them to be defeated in order to shock them back awake. To bring them to the place where they are in verse 26, where they weep before him and offer sacrifices with the ark and the priest in the proper way. God allowed them to suffer the consequences of their rebellion against him to call them back to him. God is trying to wake them up and bring them back. And what we see in the story is that it works partially. They fast, and they make offerings, and when they ask him the third time if they should go and fight, he says, go, for tomorrow I will give them into your hands. They return to God, and he says he'll give them victory. However, we see that their return to God is short-lived, because then they go into battle the next day with this plan that they've hatched that is incredibly complicated and came out of their minds. They do what they think is best, so they set this complicated ambush against the Benjamites. Some of the men attack the city, and when the Benjamites come out to fight the Israelites again, they run away and draw the men away from the city, and the men waiting in ambush rush into the city, kill everyone there, men, women, children, and they set the city on fire. And when the Benjamites turn around and see the city on fire, they retreat and run away, and Israel pursues them and kills all but 600 of the fighting force. And the Bible tells us that then, of course, continuing to do as they see fit, the men of Israel then go through all the towns of Benjamin, all the towns of Benjamin, and slaughter everything there, men, women, children, animals, and they set all the towns on fire. And do not be mistaken at this point of the story, they are not following God when they do this. They are following 
themselves. They got upset about what had happened, decided it was wrong, and then decided for themselves how to handle it. That's what happens when we decide for ourselves. But then chapter 21 starts. And the Israelites realize there's a problem now. When the Israelites went to war, all the men of Israel took two oaths. The first oath was that no one would give their daughter in marriage to a Benjamite. And they realized that they've made a problem with this oath. Because they've killed all the women of the tribe of Benjamin. In effect, by doing this, they have completely wiped out the tribe because there are 600 men of Benjamin left, but those men will have no wives and therefore no children, and the whole tribe will eventually, very quickly, cease to exist. We cause problems when we handle things our own way and do what we see as best. So there's this problem. But of course, there's the second oath that they took. And the second oath was that anyone who didn't come out to war with them would be killed also. And they look around and they realize that the men of Jabesh Gilead had not come out to war. So according to their oath, everyone there has to die now too, because that's what they saw fit and they've made a promise and they have to keep their promise. But they come up with a solution on their own. We're going we're gonna to solve both problems our own way. They, just, they try to handle a bad situation in their own way. And instead of killing everyone, they resolve to kill everyone except the virgin women who are in Jabesh Gilead, who they then take and give to the Benjamites' as wives so the whole tribe won't be wiped out. Solution! We solve the problem that we created with our own thing. Except the problem is there's still a problem. Because in Jabesh Gilead, there are only 400 virgin women, and there are still 600 Benjamite men. So the math doesn't work. So they continue to do what they're doing, and they come up with another solution to the problem they've created. All on their own. I mean, so far, their plans have worked so great, there's no possible need to ask God and seek godly wisdom on this, because they're doing so good so far, right? So this is their solution. They say to the leftover, the 200 leftover men of Benjamin, you know, in a little bit, we're going to have this festival to Yahweh at Shiloh. And, And while we're having this festival to God, what you guys ought to do is go hide there. And at some point during the festival, you know, we're probably going to be looking the other way. And when the girls of the town come out to join in the celebration to God, just, you know, take one for yourself. And if their fathers or their brothers get mad, we'll smooth it over with them saying, well, you know that oath we took? You guys didn't violate the oath because technically you didn't give your daughter to those Benjamites. And the Bible says that that's what happens. Each of the leftover men of Benjamin kidnaps for himself a wife. And everybody goes home. And then the book of Judges concludes by telling us again that there was no king in Israel and everyone was doing what they thought was best. Now, that's the end of the book of Judges. Some of the books of the Bible, just this is not part of my sermon, some of the books of the Bible end very unsatisfactorily. Judges is one of them. Jonah's another one. This is an awful story. All, in fact, all the stories at the end of the book of Judges are awful. And they are there to show us the consequences of the final statement of the book of Judges. In a world where no one looks to God for how to live, and instead each person decides for themselves what's right, This is what happens, and it is horrible. In this section, we see the Israelites march to battle against their brothers because they're upset, and they think that that's what they should do. 
God tries to knock the sense into them by letting them be defeated twice and having 400 men die. And it works for about 12 seconds. Then they go back to doing their own thing. They slaughter a whole tribe and then have to come up with another plan to fix the problem that they made by having, finding wives for the few men that are left from that tribe. All because they're angry and indignant at the people of Gibeah because the priest told them that they raped his concubine and the men of Israel have decided that that is horrible. And they're justified in doing whatever follows. But what you have to notice in this story is that they are still picking and choosing what's right and wrong for themselves. Rape is horrible. And the Bible says that the punishment for the rapist is death. The punishment for the rapist, not for his whole family and everyone he's ever met, just so we're clear. But you'll remember a few chapters ago, the people of Dan set up a false priest and false idols in their town. Do you know what the Bible says the punishment for idolatry is? Yep, death. Deuteronomy chapter 13 says that if there is a prophet who encourages you to follow other gods, you must not listen to him and he must be put to death. It says if your own brother or son or daughter or wife or even your closest friends say to you, let's go worship other gods, don't listen to them, they must be put to death. Verse 12 of Deuteronomy 13 says, if there is a town where the people are saying, let's worship other gods, investigate it. And if it's true, you must destroy the town completely and all of its people, and the city is to never be rebuilt. So the Bible makes it very clear to us that both rape and idolatry are very serious offenses in God's eyes. So why didn't the people of Israel march out into civil war against the tribe of Dan? You see, this is what happens when people decide for themselves instead of following God. We pick and choose what's bad and what's not such a big deal. So here for the Israelites, what happened to Gibeah is horrible, but Dan, eh, no big deal. We pick some things that are wrong and we let other things slide. And we live in a society today that is in the exact same way. Some bad things are bad. But other bad things? Not such a big deal. In fact, in our society, both of the examples I just presented to you are seen as no big deal. The crime that got the Israelites so upset, rape. How is that viewed in our society? The Bible says the punishment for rape is death, the death sentence. But according to the U.S. government, the average sentence in America for rape is just shy of 15 years in prison. And most of those sentenced to that 15 years will end up serving about half of that. Sounds like we've decided for ourselves that that's not a big deal. And seriously, in America today, what even is idolatry? In our country, people worship everything and anything. It's seen as no big deal. You do you, man. If, if it helps you, you go for it. Sounds good to me. No. Even Christians shy away from this one. But we should be standing up and declaring the truth that Jesus is the only way. But we don't. You know why? Because even we aren't really sure that we want to hold to telling others that Jesus should be their king. And there's actually any number of examples we could talk about where we have decided to reject God's authority on, authority on an issue that we think that he, was, he might have been wrong when he told us that something's wrong. I mean, uh, and you know this is the case. You, you know that if I started naming things right now, Christians would get angry with me because we've, we've rejected God and we decide for ourselves. So if I, if I start pointing out things like, you know, the Bible says divorce is wrong, someone's bound to get offended. But it is. If I say that even Christians treat premarital sex as no big deal, that it's not a big deal for two people to live together outside of marriage. Uh, if I say that, someone's going to get angry with me. Someone might even walk out. But that doesn't change the truth. God says those things are wrong. If I say that God says we're to seek unity and reconciliation with other believers, and that you are choosing to sin 
if you hold grudges or look down on a fellow believer or if you refuse to be reconciled with them. If I say you get up and walk out on your brothers and sisters, that that's wrong. If an argument with them makes you that upset that you leave, that that's wrong. If I say that, people are going to get angry with me. They'll say I'm unfairly condemning some people. I can make it simpler though. If I were to point out that having a bad attitude and complaining is a big deal to God, you know what will happen? People will get angry, have a bad attitude, and complain. And the reason is we decide for ourselves what is right and wrong. We don't care what God says, and there are many other examples of us choosing that one thing is a big deal and another thing is not. We need to return to the only true source of right and wrong, God's Word. And if you don't like what it says, too bad. When we decide on our own, when we do what we think is best, we mess up. And the consequences of our mistake can be huge and long-lasting. Look at what happened to the Israelites from doing what they thought was best. They slaughtered a whole tribe because they were furious about what the priest told them. That the men of Gibeah raped his concubine. Remember, he doesn't even mention the homosexual stuff. That rape is just so horrible in their eyes, all the rest of that falls out. But in doing what they thought was best in their own way, they end up doing exactly what the men of Gibeah did. They force women to marry the men of Benjamin, even allowing girls to be kidnapped to solve the problem that they created by not doing things God's way. This is the situation we put ourselves in when we do what we think is best. And it's why we must return to relying on God's word to tell us how to live and how not to live. It is why we must live life God's way. And I am sorry that we are ending the book of Judges and that I can't end the book of Judges on a happy positive note for you because that's not what the book is about. The book of Judges exists to call us to sit in judgment on ourselves, to evaluate ourselves. What we see in the book of Judges is that if you live by the cycle of the book of Judges, constantly drifting away from God to be like the world around you and only returning periodically when something happens, if you don't make effort to break that cycle, eventually your drift away from God becomes complete. And you are like everyone else around you, rejecting God's authority and doing what you think is best. And what it shows us is that when we do that, it leads to disaster, disaster for the nation, for families, and for individuals. So hear the warning of the book of Judges. Heed the voice of God calling you back to him that the Israelites missed. Follow God. Rely on his word. Don't decide for yourself. Jesus must be your king.